Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare planetary systems. At the time of Krishna's birth, the planetary systems were automatically adjusted so that everything became auspicious. Unless it's a super long paragraph with Tanish, then you can share it. We'll just need to read something. Read kind of, uh, now this is Shik, man, maybe she's Tostikum, but Shik. It's Who like the razor. Might not know, but he just informed me a couple of days ago that he was like the go to man for reading Krishna books back in the day. So I was really Well, I just used to read on in vans when I was traveling on Sakatan. Nice. Um, Hadi Prush has said I would go back to Godhead from reading, so I've kinda of taken it to heart. Which is the last paragraph you're in? Just we're just starting. <clears throat> At that time, in all directions, east, west, south, north, everywhere, there was an atmosphere of peace and prosperity. There were auspicious stars visible in the sky, <clears throat> and on the surface in all towns and villages or pasturing grounds, and within the minds of everyone there were signs of good fortune. The rivers were flowing full of waters, and lakes were beautifully decorated with lotus flowers. The forests were full of beautiful birds and peacocks, and all the birds within the forest began to sing with sweet voices, and the peacocks began to dance along with their consorts. The wind blew very pleasantly, carrying the aroma of different flowers, and the sensation of bodily touch was very pleasing. At home, the brahmanas, who were accustomed to offer sacrifices in the fire, found their homes very pleasant for offerings, Due to disturbances created by the demoniac kings, the sacrificial fire had almost been stopped in the houses of brahmanas, but now they could find the opportunity to start the fire peacefully. Being forbidden to offer sacrifices, the brahmanas were very distressed in mind, intelligence, and activities, but just on the point of Krishna's appearance, automatically their minds became full of joy because they could hear the loud vibrations in the sky of transcendental sounds proclaiming the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Isn't this a nice thing to do? <laughs> the denizens of the Gandharva and Kanara planets began to sing and the denizens of Siddhaloka and the planets of the Charanas began to offer prayers in the service of the Personality of Godhead. In the heavenly planets, the angels, along with their wives, accompanied by the Apsaras, began to dance. The great sages and demigods, being pleased, began to shower flowers. At the seashore, there was a sound of mild waves and above the sea there were clouds in the sky which began to thunder very pleasingly. When things were adjusted like this, Lord Vishnu, who is residing within the heart of every living entity, appeared in the darkness of night as the Supreme Personality of Godhead before Devaki, who also appeared as one of the demigoddesses. The appearance of Lord Vishnu at that time could be compared with the full moon in the sky as it rises on the eastern horizon. The objection may be raised that since Lord Krishna appeared on the eighth day of the waning moon, 
there could be no rising of the full moon. In answer to this, it may be said that Lord Krishna appeared in the dynasty, which is in the hierarchy of the moon. Therefore, although the moon was incomplete on that night, because of a Lord's appearance in the dynasty, where the moon is himself the original person, the moon was in an overjoyous condition, so by the grace of Krishna, he could appear just as a full moon. In an a astronomical treatise, can you speak a little tiny louder? Sure. In an astronomical treatise by the name of Kamanikya, the constellations at the time of the appearance of Lord Krishna are very nicely described. It is confirmed that the child born at that auspicious moment was the supreme Brahman of the absolute truth. Vasudev saw that the wonderful child born as a baby with four hands, holding conch shell, club disc, and lotus flower, decorated with Mark of Srivatsa, wearing the jeweled necklace of Kastuba stone, dressed in yellow silk, appearing dazzling like a bright blackish cloud, wearing a helmet bedecked with the Vaiduri stone, valuable bracelets, earrings, and similar ornaments all over his body, and beautified by an abundance of hair on his head. Due to the extraordinary features of the child, Vasudeva was struck with wonder. How could a newly born child be so decorated? He could therefore understand that Lord Krishna had now appeared, and he became overpowered by the occasion. Vasudeva very humbly wondered that although he was an ordinary living entity conditioned by the material nature, and was externally imprisoned by Kamsa, the all-pervading personality of Godhead, Vishnu or Krishna, had appeared as a child in his home, exactly in his original position. No earthly child is born with four hands, decorated with ornaments and nice clothing, fully equipped with all the signs of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Over and over again, Vasudev glanced at his child and he considered how to celebrate his, this auspicious moment. Generally, when a male child is born, he thought, people observe the occasion with jubilant celebrations, and in my home, although I am imprisoned, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has taken birth. How many millions and millions of times I'd be prepared to observe this auspicious ceremony. When Vasudev, who is also called Anakadamudubi, was looking at his newborn baby, he was so happy that he wanted to give many thousands of cows in charity to the Brahmanas. According to the Vedic system, whenever there is an auspicious ceremony in the Kshatriya king's palace, out of joy the king gives many things in charity. Cows decorated with golden ornaments are delivered to the Brahmanas and sages. Vasudev wanted to perform a charitable ceremony to celebrate Krishna's appearance, but because he was shackled within the walls of Kamsa's prison, this was not possible. Instead, within his mind, he gave thousands of cows to the Brahmanas. When Vasudev was convinced that the newborn child was the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, he bowed down with folded hands and began to offer him prayers. At that time, Vasudev was in the transcendental position and he became completely free from all, f all fear of Kamsa. The newborn baby was also flashing his effulgence within the room in which he appeared. Vasudev then began to offer his prayers. My dear Lord, I can understand who you are. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the super soul of all living entities and the absolute truth. You have appeared in your own eternal form, which is directly perceived by us. I understand that because I am afraid of Kamsa, you have appeared just to deliver me from that fear. You do not belong in this, to this material world. You are the same person who brings about the cosmic manifestation simply by glancing over material nature. <clears throat> One may argue that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who creates the whole cosmic manifestation simply by his glance, cannot come within the womb of Devaki, the wife of Vasudev. To eradicate this argument, Vasudev says, My dear Lord, it is not a very wonderful thing that you have appeared within the womb of Devaki, because the creation was also made in that way. You were lying on the causal ocean as Mahavishnu, and by your breathing process, innumerable universes came into existence. Then you entered into each of the universes as Garbhodakshaya Vishnu. Then again you expanded yourself as Chirakdakshaya Vishnu, and entered into the hearts of all living entities, and entered even within the atoms. Therefore your entrance into the womb of Devaki is understandable in the same way. You appear to have entered, but you are simultaneously all-pervading. We can understand your entrance and non-entrance 
for material examples. Should I just stop there? I'll finish okay. the paragraph. The total material energy remains intact, even after being divided into 16 elements. The material body is nothing but the combination of the five gross elements, namely earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Whenever there is a material body, it appears that such elements are newly created, but actually the elements are always existing outside of the body. Similarly, although you have appeared as a child in the womb of Devaki, you are also existing outside. You are always in your abode, but still you can simultaneously expand yourself into millions of forms. <laughs> so then we are, our next stop will be to the home of Murti and Purnima. <laughs> Thank you. I hope, um, David and Underprivilege, thank you for being part of the kickoff, and um, I hope everybody else can continue at least for a little while, and if you can't, thank you for being here. Are you going to come with us? Yeah. You have therefore raised me many times as your child with great affection and love, and I am therefore very much pleased and obliged to you. And I assure you that this time you shall go back home back to Godhead on account of your perfection in your mission. I know you are very concerned about me and afraid of Kamsa. Therefore, I order you to take me immediately to Gokul and exchange me for the daughter who has just been born to Yashoda. So I'm going to move it, you know, a little because of the time factor. So, me? can you read? I can read. Kamsa begins his persecutions. After Vasudev adjusted all the doors and gates, the gatekeepers awoke and heard the newborn child crying. Kamsa was waiting to hear the news of the child's birth. And the gatekeepers immediately approached him and informed him that the child was born. At that time, Kamsa got up from his bed very quickly and exclaimed, Now the cruel death of my life is born. Kamsa became perplexed, now that his death was approaching, and his hair stood on end. Immediately, he proceeded toward the place where the child was born. Devaki, on seeing her brother approaching, prayed in a very meek attitude to Kamsa. My dear brother, please do not kill this female child. I promise that this child will be the wife of your son. Therefore, don't kill her. You are not to be killed by any female child. That was the omen. You were to be killed by a male child. So please do not kill her. My dear brother, you've killed so many of my children who were born shining as the sun. That is not your fault. You have been advised by demoniac friends to kill my children. 
But now, I beg you to excuse this girl. Let her live as my daughter. Kamsa was so cruel that he did not listen to the pitiful prayers of his sister David. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Kamsa was so cruel that he did not listen to the pitiful prayers of his sister Devaki. He forcibly grabbed the newborn child to rebuke his sister and attempted to dash her on the stone mercilessly. This is a graphic example of a cruel demon who could sacrifice all relationships for the sake of personal gratification. But immediately the child slipped out of his hands, went up into the sky, and appeared with eight arms as the younger sister of Vishnu. She was decorated with nice garments and flower garlands and ornaments. In her eight hands she held a bow, lance, arrows, sword, conch shell, disc, club, and shield. Seeing the appearance of the child, who was actually the goddess Durga, all the demigods from the different planets of like Siddhalok, Charnalok, Gandharvalok, Apsaralok, Kinnaralok, and Ugrugalok presented her with various articles and began to offer their respective prayers. From above, the goddess addressed Kamsa, You rascal, how can you kill me? The child who will kill you is already born before me somewhere in this world. Don't be so cruel to your poor sister. After this appearance, Goddess Durga became known by various names in various parts of the world. After hearing these words, Kamsa became very much overwhelmed with fear. Out of pity, he immediately re released Vasudev and Devaki from the bondage of their shackles and very politely began to address them. He said, my dear sister and brother-in-law, I have acted just like a demon in killing my own nephews, your children, and thereby I have given up all consideration of our intimate relationship. I do not know what will be the result of these envious acts of mine. Probably I shall be sent to the hell where killers of, killers of Brahmins go. I am surprised, however, that the celestial prophecy has not come true. False propaganda is not found only in human society. Now it appears that even the celestial denizens speak lies. Because I believed in the words of the celestial denizens, I have committed so many sins by killing the children of my sister. My dear Vasudev and Devaki, you are both very great souls. I have nothing to instruct you. But still, I request that you not be sorry for the death of your children. Every one of us is under the control of superior power, and that superior power does not allow us to remain together. We are bound to be separated from our friends and relatives in due course of time. But we must know for certain that even after the disappearance of the different material bodies, the soul remains intact eternally. For example, there are many pots made of earthly clay, and they are prepared and also broken. But in spite of this, the earth remains as it is perpetually. Similarly, the bodies of the soul under different conditions are made and destroyed, but the spirit soul remains eternally, so there is nothing to lament over. Everyone should understand that this material body is different from the spirit soul, and so long as one does not come to that understanding, he is sure to accept the process of transmigration from one body to another. My dear sister Devaki, you are so gentle and kind. Please excuse me, don't be aggrieved by the death of your children, which I have caused. Actually, this was not done by me, because all these are, pre because all these are predestined activities. One has to act according to the predestined plan, even unwillingly. People misunderstand that with the end of the body, the self dies, or they think that one can kill another living entity. All these misconceptions oblige one to accept the conditions of material existence. In other words, as long as one is not firmly convinced of the eternality of the soul, one is sub subjected to the tribulation of being killer and killed. My dear sister Devaki and brother-in-law Vasudev, kindly excuse the atrocities I have committed against you. I am very poor-hearted, and you are so great-hearted, so take compassion upon me and excuse me. 
While Kamsa was speaking to his brother-in-law and sister, tears flowed from his eyes, and he fell down at their feet. Believing the words of Durga Devi, who he had tried to kill, Kamsa immediately released his brother-in-law and sister. He personally unlocked the iron shackles and very sympathetically showed his friendship to his family members. When Devaki saw her brother so repentant, she also became pacified and forgot all his atrocious activities against her children. Vasudev also, forgetting all past incidents, spoke smilingly with his brother-in-law. Vasudev told Kamsa, quote, My dear fortunate brother-in-law, what you are saying about the material body and the soul is correct. Every living entity is born ignorant, misunderstanding this material body to be his self. This conception of life is due to ignorance, and on the basis of this ignorance we create enmity or friendship. Lamentation, jubilation, fearfulness, envy, greed, illusion, and madness are different features of our material concept of life. A person influenced like this engages in enmity due only to the material body. Being engaged in such activities, we forget our eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead." End quote. Body to be the self. When Vasudev talked with Kamsa in such an illuminating way, Kamsa became very pleased and his guilt for killing his nephew subdued. With the permission of his sister, Devaki and brother-in-law Vasudev returned to his home with a relieved mind. But the next day Kamsa called all his counselors together and narrated to, and narrated to them all the incidents that have happened the night before. All the counselors of Kamsa were demons and eternal enemies of the demigods, so they became depressed upon hearing their masters speak of the night's events. And although they were not very much ex experienced or learned, they began to give instructions to Kamsa as follows. Dear sir, let us now make an arrangement to kill all the children who were born within the last 10 days in all towns, countries, villages, and pasturing grounds. Let us, ex let, let, let us ex execute uh, this plan indiscriminately. We think that the demigods cannot do anything against us if we perform these atrocities. They are always afraid of fighting with us, and even if they wish to check our activities, they will not dare to do so. Because of the immeasurable strength of your bow, they fear you. Indeed, we have practical experience that whenever you stood to fight with them uh, they, and began to shower your arrows on them, they immediately began to flee in all directions just to save their lives. Many of the demigods were unable to fight with you and they immediately surrendered themselves unto you by opening their turbans and the flags of their heads. With the folded hands, they begged you to spare them and said, My Lord, we are all afraid of your strength. Please release us from this dangerous fight. We, all, we have also seen many times that you will never kill such surrendered fighters when they were all fearful, their bows, arrows, and chariots broken, forgetful of their military activities, and unable to fight with you. So actually, we have nothing to fear from these demigods. They are very proud of being great fighters in peacetime outside of the war field, but actually they cannot show any talent or military power on the war field. Although Lord Vishnu, Lord Shiva, and Lord Brahma are always ready to help the demigods headed by Indra, we have no reason to be afraid of them. As far as Lord Vishnu is concerned, he has already hidden himself within the hearts of all living entities, and he cannot come out. As far as Lord Shiva is concerned, he has renounced all activities. He has already entered into the forest. And Lord Brahma is always engaged in different types of austerities and meditation. And what to speak of Indra, he is strong in comparison to your strength. Therefore, we have nothing to fear from all the demigods, but we must not neglect them because the demigods are our determined enemies. We must be careful to protect ourselves, to root them out from their very existence. We should just engage ourselves in your service and be always ready for your command. The demons continue to say, if there is some disease in the body which is neglected, it becomes incurable. Similarly, when one is not careful about restraining the senses and lets them loose, it is very difficult to control them at all. Therefore, we must always be very careful of the demigods before they get too strong and to be subdued. The foundation of strength of the demigods is Lord Vishnu, 
because the ultimate goal of all religious principles is to satisfy him. The Vedic injunctions, the brahmanas, the cows, austerity, sacrifices, performances of charity, and distribution of wealth are all for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu. So let us immediately begin by killing all the brahmanas who are in charge of the Vedic knowledge and the great sages who are in charge of sacrificial ritualistic performances. Let us kill all the cows which are the source of butter which is so necessary for performing sacrifices. Please give us your permission to kill all these creatures. Actually, <coughs> the limits of the transcendental body of the Lord, Vish of Lord Vishnu are the brahmanas, the cows, Vedic knowledge, austerity, truthfulness, sense and mind control, faithfulness, charity, tolerance, and performance of sacrifices. Lord Vishnu is situated in everyone's heart and is the leader of all demigods, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. Therefore, we think that to persecute the great sages and brahmanas is to kill Lord Vishnu. Thus, being advised by his demoniac ministers, Kamsa, who was from the very beginning the greatest rascal, decided to persecute the brahmanas and the Vaishnavas, being entrapped by the shackles of all devouring eternal time. He ordered the demons to harass all kinds of saintly persons, and he entered into his house. And then he entered into his house. The adherents of Kamsu were all influenced by the mode of passion as well as illusioned by the mode of ignorance, and their only business was to create enmity with saintly persons. Such activities can only reduce one's duration of life the demons accelerated the process and invited their deaths as soon as possible. The result of persecuting saintly persons is not only untimely death. The act is so offensive that the perpetrator also gradually loses his beauty, his fame, and his religious principles, and thus his promotion to the higher planets is checked. Driven by various kinds of mental concoctions, the demons diminish all kinds of auspicious auspiciousness. An offense at the lotus feet of the devotees and brahmanas is a greater offense than that committed at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A civilization that commits such sinful activities generally loses all faith in the Supreme Lord. And as such, a godless civilization becomes the source of all calamities in human society. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the fourth chapter of Krishna. Kamsa begins his persecutions. Mm. Very nice. How many versions of Krishna book are there now? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, this, is, this is like Tosi was explaining. They're not changing Prabhupada's words, but they're condensing. So there's going to be another. And like this year. This was longer than mine. Yeah. I know. Like an extra sentence. There, so there was a whole extra it. paragraph in this one when we were reading like from that book. That, that's one of the originals. Anyway, as long as it's about Krishna, as long as you don't take Krishna out of it, then we're back. Yeah, the original tapes. You can still listen to some of the original tapes. Yeah, the tapes are there. You know, so I'm just saying, you, can, you know, you can get that. But I think you know they're not. Changing the but for congregational reading, it's nice to have the same book. <laughs> <laughs> well, their Krishna Path is putting out all the original ones. Yeah, the original. They're digitizing all of Prabhupada's original books. I just got the Srimad Bhagavatam in in uh, KrishnaPath.org. That's who I read for. But uh, you know, I don't get into the book controversy because I just like to read. It's on, it's on YouTube. Hmm? It's on YouTube, yeah. I posted, yeah. I posted it on the village. Gruda and Dravida. What's the Siddhanta? Uh, he made them on the phone, but... Um, but anyway, you can just go to Gruda. It's all one. one. It's all one. It was, no. <laughs> it's all two? And he was explaining what they did and why they did it. And that, actually, in some cases, the people thought more and more problems were in the words. They had actually... Beginning when the agreement was heavy, some yeah. of those words had really been lost. They were actually restoring them. So what they thought they were 
losing, they're actually getting back. So mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting. And then, you know, it's some examples. Well, the of what biggest they can mistake lose. was that we um, erased the tapes to save money. <laughs> you know, what? what? You don't know that? No. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada would translate, send the tapes, they would transcribe, and then oh. erase them and send them back to Prabhupada. To oh. so use the tapes over. Yeah. Oh, back in the back in the poverty days. Yeah. Well, that was. So about that Richard Nixon? What was she would have done that? So precious, you know. Okay. So. What's the What's the schedule? I'm going to have to miss one of these. Yeah. What's the name of the? Krishna Path. Krishna Path dot org or dot com. They own both of the. Uh, K R S K R I S H N A P A T H. Where's your car, sisters? I have oh, I've read I've read you know, like a lot of those, it, 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 but there are also other part? devotees reading audio oh, books and really all of there's PDF files of all of Prabhupada's original books on there too. So you can just read them from your phone. every night but it's a different volume. Yep. You okay? Yeah. Well, I'll sit, I'll, 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 I'm going to massage her while you talk while we're doing the reading. I'll make her some water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you like. Yeah. yeah. Coconut or just regular? Just mm -hmm. regular is good. Okay. Your cups, right? Yeah, right there. Although Krishna was the real son of Vasudeva and Devaki, because of Kamsa's atrocious activities, Vasudeva could not enjoy the birth ceremony of his son. But Nanda Maharaj, the foster father, celebrated the birth ceremony of Krishna very joyfully. The next day it was declared that a male child was born of Yasoda. According to Vedic custom, Nanda Maharaj called for learned astrologers and brahmanas to perform the birth ceremony. After the birth of a child, the astrologers calculate the moment of the birth and take make a horoscope of the child's future life. Another ceremony takes place after the birth of the child. Family members take baths, cleanse themselves, and decorate themselves with ornaments and garlands. Then they come before the child and the astrologer to hear of the future life of the child. 
Nanda Maharaj and other members of the family dressed and sat down in front of the birthplace. All the brahmanas who, who were assembled there on this occasion chanted auspicious mantras according to the rituals while the astrologers performed the birth ceremony. Oh, yes, according to the rituals while the astrologers performed the birth ceremony. All the demigods are also worshipped on this occasion as well as the forefathers of the family. Nanda Maharaj distributed 200,000 well-decorated, dressed and ornamented cows to the brahmanas. He not only gave cows in charity, but hills of grains decorated with golden bordered garments and many ornaments. Stop there. Okay. <laughs> in the material world, we possess riches and wealth in many ways, but sometimes not in very honest and pious ways, because that is the nature of accumulating wealth. According to Vedic injunction, therefore, one should purify such wealth by giving cows and gold and charity to the brahmanas. A newborn child is also purified by gifts of grains in charity to the brahmanas. In this material world, it is to be understood that we are always living in a contaminated state. We therefore have to purify the duration of our lives, our possession of wealth and ourself. We can purify our duration of life by taking a daily bath and cleansing the body inside and outside and accepting the ten kinds of purificatory processes. By austerities, by worship of the Lord, and by distributing of charity, we can purify the position of wealth. We can purify ourselves by studying the Vedas in order to understand the absolute truth and achieve self-realization. It is therefore stated in the Vedic literature that by birth everyone is born a Sudra, that by accepting the purificatory process one becomes twice born, that by studying the Vedas one becomes a Vipra which is the preliminary qualification for becoming a brahmana, and that when one perfectly understands the absolute truth, he is called a brahmana. And when the brahmana reaches further perfection, it becomes a vaishnava, or a devotee. <laughs> In Krishna's birth ceremony, all the assembled brahmanas began to chant different kinds of Vedic mantras to invoke all good fortune for the child. There are different kinds of chanting, known as sutta, Magda, Vandi, <coughs> Viridavali. Along with this chanting of mantras and songs, bugles and kettle drums sounded outside the house. On this occasion, the joyous vibrations could be heard in all the pasturing grounds and all the houses. Within and, without and outside of the houses, there were varieties of artistic paintings done with rice pulp and scented water was sprinkled everywhere, even on the roads and streets. Ceilings and roofs were decorated with different kinds of flags, festoons, and green leaves. The gates were made of green leaves and flowers. All the cows, bulls, and calves were smeared with a mixture of oil and turmeric and painted with minerals like red oxide, yellow clay, and manganese. They wore garlands of peacock feathers and were covered with nice wow. colored cloths and gold necklaces. Yeah. Make some garlands of peacock feathers. Uh, oh. yes. Nice. <laughs> Shall I read? Okay. Yes, please. Okay. When all the ecstatic cowherd men heard that Nanda Maharaj, father of Krishna, was celebrating the birth ceremony of his son, they became spontaneously joyful. They dressed themselves with very costly garments and ornamented their bodies with different kinds of earrings and necklaces and wore great turbans on their heads. After dressing themselves in this gorgeous way, they took various kinds of presentations and thus approached the house of Nanda Maharaj. As soon as they heard that Mother Yashoda had given birth to a child, all the cowherd women became very overwhelmed with joy, and they also dressed themselves with various kinds of costly garments and or ornaments, smeared scented cosmetics on their bodies. Okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare